Lauren Lovett is in charge of the Major Gifts team and um, it's her job to bring in some of the major, major donations that come into the charity from all sorts of organisations um, around um, the UK and we'll hear more about who they are very, very soon. But um, first of all, let's welcome Lauren Lovett to Erskine Veterans Radio. Great to speak to you, Lauren. Hi, Ian. Thank you. First of all, start by telling us a bit about yourself, because uh, you've been working for, for Erskine for a little bit. But tell us about uh, how long you've been uh, working at Erskine, how you found your way to, to the Erskine charity. Sure thing. OK, so I started working for Erskine in the summer of 2006. Well, at the time, I was a volunteer. So I was working in a similar fundraising role at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Um, and I was doing some volunteering work in my spare time in the Erskine home. And I had been buddied up with a dementia resident who I used to take out for a walk and a coffee and just simple things like that to, to spend some time and, and give the resident some company. Um, and I was really, I guess, inspired to do that because my own grandfather had been a resident in the original Erskine hospital and had spent his final years living at Erskine and being cared for at Erskine um, in a wonderful way, as is the norm um, at Erskine. So I, after my grandfather had been cared for at Erskine, I went on to become a volunteer. Um, And during the time that I was volunteering, a job ad popped up in the fundraising department, which I applied for. um, And yes, the last 15 years is now history. (laughs) And that's how I came to be in post. And this is uh, obviously the major gifts team. It gives a, an allu- a bit of a, a clue, but uh, this is like the real big stuff, isn't it? And uh, we we'll start with grant front fundraising, and, and we see that luckily and fortunately, Erskine is is um, uh, proud to be the beneficiary of, of many large grants over over the years, and really crucial to um, keeping the whole operation going. But this are, these are the real big donations from some of the big other uh, organisations that um, that support charities such as Erskine? Yes, that's correct. So we we focus um, on large grants, um, but we work in a whole range, um, a whole, with a whole range of funders and a whole range of grants at different levels. So anything within a financial year from £50 to £150,000 to beyond. Um, and it all just very much depends upon what working on within a financial year and at any given time. So if we have, for example, a big meaty capital project to work on, then you would be looking at grants of six, sometimes seven figures. Um, And then if you're working more in the realms of running costs, so trying to bring in the money that we need to keep Erskine running day to day, then it, as I say, it could be anything from somebody who wants to give us £50 up to somebody who wants to give us £200,000 to try and keep um, care services running. How important are charitable grants to Erskine? Because they, they must be a big boost when you get them. Yes, absolutely. So they are hugely important and they form a large part of our voluntary income at Erskine. So we, we are... What we are essentially doing is working with charitable grants and charitable trusts and foundations, um, benevolent organisations such as the Army Benevolent Fund or the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund and other grant making organisations. And typically within um, a year at Erskine, we might bring anything between £800,000 to a million pounds in voluntary income through grants. So it is a significant element of our of our fundraising um, and it does make a direct tangible difference to the lives of Erskine residents and other Erskine beneficiaries. And how do Erskine residents benefit from grant fundraising on you know on a, on a regular basis? What are the sort of things that they could probably see that are a result of grant fundraising? Probably some good examples of, of tangible um, items, if you like, that were brought in recently for residents. So it could be anything from transport. So over the past year, we've had a couple of funders who have purchased wheelchair accessible caddies for our residents. Um, and they'll go on to benefit from that in a number of ways. So it could be that they're taken to their hospital appointments using that caddy. 
They could be taken out on a, a trip. Um, they could go shopping. Or it could be that we go and collect one of their relatives from the local train station and bring them to the home and visit. So really direct, tangible benefits for the residents when you raise funds to buy a piece of equipment like that. Um, other things that we've done recently, we have, at Erskine, you've probably heard before that we have an advanced nurse practitioner team. So these are the really highly specialised nurses who are based in the Erskine Home in Bishopton. They can treat residents on site, they can prescribe for residents on site, and we've been able to assist their work by bringing in some equipment in recent years. So things like a bladder scanner, um, an ECG machine. So all these things can be used on site at the point at which a resident becomes unwell and hopefully result in quick early intervention so that they don't become more seriously unwell. And also by having that equipment on site, it benefits multiple numbers of residents. So we've got 180 residents in the Erskine home, we've got 40 residents in the Erskine Park home on the site in Bishopton, and they all have access to that type of equipment. So these are the kind of direct um, benefits of grant fundraising to residents. Getting the this kind of funding is not as easy as just picking up the phone and saying, "Can I have, you know, um, ten thousand or a hundred thousand pounds, please?" Yeah. Because we'd like to do this. There's obviously a big application process um, involving a lot of forms and meetings and planning and showing what you intend to do with the money. It's it's you know quite a thorough process, isn't it? To talk us through the the kind of uh, hoops that you might have to jump through in order to, uh, to to get to to where you need to be. Yes, for sure. Um, it would be lovely if it was easy as just picking up the phone and saying, um, could we have a grant, please? And are you a yes or a no? Um, yeah, I mean, some of the some of the applications we work on are quite complex and we can't do them on our own. Um, so the members of my team have to work really closely with service delivery staff um, and with our finance team as well, because there's, with most applications, there's... Um, a significant part of writ written work involved, but there's also the budget work involved. So funders will want to see very specifically what your project or your piece of equipment costs, um, how much you're asking from them and what that money would ultimately achieve. So we have to work really closely with other colleagues at Erskine. Um, and we have one member on our team who is more or less dedicated to fundraising for the activity centre. So I'm sure um, you'll have heard about the work of the Activity Centre through other interviews. Um, and that's different to care. It's still a charitable service delivered by Erskine, um, but it's for a, a different group of beneficiaries. We're actually on the cusp, or we've just started our next financial year. So our financial year runs from the 1st of October to the 30th of September. So Vicky will sit with the Activity Centre manager look at what the next year looks like for AirMac, um, what areas we need funding, what projects we need funding for, do we need any equipment, and um, work very closely with um, the Activity Centre Manager and her team on what the needs of the centre will be over the next year. Um, we also work very closely with beneficiaries. So, for example, carrying out things like focus groups to find out what members of the Activity Centre want to see happening at the, at the activity centre. There's no point in us delivering services if they don't actually meet a need or um, if it's what people want. So we do a lot of work in that area as well. Our guest this week is Lauren Lovett, who is the Major Gifts Manager for the Erskine Veterans Charity. And she is in charge of getting some of the major donations that we see and that we like to shout about when we do get them. Uh, many thousands of pounds and a lot of work goes in behind the scenes to, to gain these, these donations, which make such a big difference to, to how the charity operates. Um, and she's going to tell us a little bit more about what goes on behind the scenes to, to get these. But first of all, Lauren... Um, the last year, the last 18 months or so, we all know that has been a, a lot different, but obviously your work has continued in, in um, spreading the word about Erskine and, and applying for grants and getting support from some of these major organisations. Can you give us um, well a roll call, really, of, of those that have helped the Erskine Veterans Charity over the last year in, in quite a major way? 
Well, the past year has been really interesting because obviously um, things have been a bit different because we've been working um, in the midst of a, of a pandemic and that has most certainly changed things at Erskine. So on, on all fronts, really, um, in the delivery of our services and our fundraising activities, it's all been affected. But we are really fortunate in that we have some very committed donors and we've really seen that through the pandemic that people have wanted to support Erskine. Um, a great example of that would be the Army Benevolent Fund, who um, typically fund Erskine to the value in the region of £150,000 per year towards the care of um, Army beneficiaries at Erskine. And they have been able to maintain that level of grant this year, which has been wonderful. Um, another similar organisation would be the Royal Navy and Royal Marines Charity. Um, who indeed increased their grant this year um, to £50,000 towards the care of Royal Navy and Royal Marine beneficiaries at Erskine. So people have really, our funders have really worked with us closely to try and support us through what has been a really challenging time um, and ensure that the level of care that, that we deliver is maintained and that the residents have everything that they need um, during what has been an exceptionally difficult period for the residents, um, as well as everybody else working at Erskine. So we've been really fortunate in that, that people have wanted to continue in their support. Some funders obviously have been financially impacted themselves um, and haven't been able to support at the level they might have previously, but have continued to support at a level that they can. And again, that just shows their commitment to Erskine. And, and the interest that they have in supporting our beneficiaries. And of course, it's it's important to remember that over the last year, um, these major donations have probably had even more significance with events not being able to be held, you know, door-to-door collections, bucket collections, whatever it might be, have all you know stopped for, for a good amount of time as well, haven't they? Yes, yeah. I mean, it's been a really challenging time for, for all charities. Um, as you say, you know, organisations that depend upon event income, that depend upon community fundraising and fundraisers being out in the midst of things. When everybody was told to stay indoors, that just became absolutely impossible. So most definitely organisations up and down the country will have taken a hit because of that. And we've definitely seen a number of grant fundraisers try to step into the breach. I don't think they would ever be able to fill the gap that's been left um, but certainly that has been a number of, of funders have stepped forward and have tried to help where they can and we certainly saw that at Erskine so then in the early stages of the pandemic there was a lot of emergency funding um, and grants that we could apply for particularly around the area of care um, and, and you know making sure that residents in care home we're safe and we're protected, um, and we we um, managed to up our levels of income in that area when it came to the, the actual emergency phase of the pandemic. And now we're at the other side of that, where there's no longer the emergency funding available, and I think we're coming out to a new landscape where people aren't entirely sure yet what it's going to look like. So a lot of the bigger funders who were very focused on the emergency phase um, and you could only apply to them for COVID-19 related projects, they are slowly coming out of that and we'll start to see their criteria change and we'll be looking at what we can apply for at Erskine that isn't COVID-19 related, you know, and hopefully gradually return to some sort of, um, well, more, more kind of, more normality, I guess. Yeah, well, that's what we all hope for, isn't it? In uh, in in every <laughs> every walk of life, I think is that, and I think you know we are getting there. And we were speaking last week about it that you know hopefully it continues in in the direction we're heading. You know, and we don't go backwards. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, we're definitely all hoping for that. <laughs> and what would you say that the most memorable or your your favourite project you've worked on during your time at Erskine? As you said, you've been there what fifteen years now. Um, what's the what's what's the the project that sticks out in your mind? Um, it's a difficult question to answer. I think when I initially started at Erskine, we were working on the build of um, two new homes. So I came in just at the point where they were about to open the Erskine Park home. 
Mm. And we were about to start building the Erskine Glasgow home and then go on to extend the Erskine Edinburgh home. And at that time, working in grant fundraising, there was um, quite, a, quite a focus on capital, capital grants and capital spend. So that was quite an exciting time because there was big projects on the go. We were asking for six and seven figures of of grant um, in our grant. Uh, sorry, I'll rephrase that. Um, we were asking for grants of six and seven figures and being successful. So that was really exciting. And it was also great to see these funders who supported our vision and who wanted to be a part of what we were trying to do for our beneficiaries. Um, so that that was that's definitely memorable and sticks with you. Um, when you come through the other side of that and you've worked on all these capital projects, so that was certainly an exciting time. But I think equally there are smaller projects that I've worked on that you see you see the benefit to residents. So it could be something really simple like bringing in a grant that allows um, for the purchase of outdoor furniture, say. And mm-hmm. the next thing, the residents are out in the garden, they're, on, they're using the furniture, they're enjoying the fresh air, they're enjoying the sunshine, and you can see that that's had a real direct impact. I would say all of them satisfying because all of them have some sort of benefit to our residents and our beneficiaries. And we've made it through um, a very tricky 18 months, almost two years now, of course. Um, What does the next year have in store for you? What are the plans ahead? You said that planning is starting to to begin, you know, looking ahead to the next financial year. What's uh, what's on the agenda? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that is our hope that things will improve. Um, What we really want to see um, are residents returning to normal activities. Um, and to see you know, the, the work that was going on in the homes pre-COVID-19 return. Um, first and foremost for the residents, um, and also means that we can return to work with our funders on these projects too. Um, I mean, I think in our area, the next year ahead will be challenging because you know a, a lot of our traditional funders were very much involved in the response to COVID-19. So we'll have to see now that they've come through that, where their priorities will lie next. Um, and there's still a number of funders who we would have worked with that haven't reopened grant programmes. So there's still a kind of sense of we have to wait and see. But equally, um, we're optimistic about what the next financial year will hold um, and very much hope that we'll be able to return to working with all of our funders in a more um usual (laughs) normal way than we have been possibly over the past 12 to 18 months um but yeah i mean our focus is always on our residents and what erskine needs how do we offset our costs to ensure that erskine can continue running for the next 100 years um and how do we ensure that we can continue to provide the highest quality of care to residents and um other charitable services to the veterans who benefit from our work and that that won't change that won't change so we'll always be on the hunt <laughs> always be on the search for the next big thing um and that you know that's an equally important part of our job is is our research and our prospect research making sure that we are on the ball um over the next 12 months and any opportunities that the airskin is you know that we are eligible to apply for that we are there we're putting our best foot forward and we're doing everything that we can to bring in the income required to, to look after.